of a break there. I know I've had uh, multiple people message me and text me and email me angrily. Um, no, not really angrily. Just saying, hey, where are you? I, I'm interested. I'm really enjoying your podcast and I want to hear more. And uh, the truth is sometimes life gets in the way. You know, I, I like to be a full-time podcaster. I mean, it must be nice to be, um, you know, some of those people that sort of sit around and just podcast about random stuff like Star Wars and movies and all sorts of <laughs> things that uh, like forensic pathology that I that I know about. Although I, I would love to have a podcast about Star Wars and movies and and all sorts of other things. But it seems that forensics is probably what I know most about. I mean, that's debatable, actually. But um, anyway, I've been really busy this summer. Um, I don't know if uh, if it's the same for other forensic pathologists, but it seems that my uh, practice gets really busy every year in August and August to September. Uh, I feel like that's sort of murder season. Um, I don't know why that is, but uh, get a lot of um, autopsies at that time, uh, some of them quite difficult. Um, court starts to ramp up. Seems like there's a lull in court during the summer, and then I start to get a lot of court cases um, during the fall, starting in September and October. But today I was able to get a little bit of free time and talk about um, today's episode, which is very going to be very uh, popular and very exciting. Actually, I don't know how exciting it's going to be, but it's uh, what it takes to be a forensic pathologist. And it's going to excite some of you. Some of you who might already be in the field are not going to be that excited because you've already done it. But I know that there are very few who are already forensic pathologists, so I'm I, you can just go do something else right now, um, unless you like to listen to my voice, and then you can sit and listen to my voice. That's fine. But the fact is, people are very interested in this field. Um, a lot of people want to go into it, particularly young people are very interested in this career. And, you know, as a result, I get multiple queries per week, usually through Instagram, sometimes Twitter, um, very commonly through YouTube, because I put up a YouTube video and, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And it, it's actually not a great YouTube video. It's sort of like just me filming it on my phone. Um, I actually think it's not a good video at all, but it of course sort of hits the basics and I get tons of questions through that video. So I'll probably put this podcast up, um, just as an audio on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately I don't have the video capability capabilities yet. Um, I think that is something I'm going to do with this podcast is make it um, an audio and a video podcast so people can can watch. I don't know how exciting it is to sit and watch me talk. Um, that does bring me to, um, you know, my first point in the podcast today, which is uh, I usually address questions or comments that people make. One of the things uh, people have asked is, am I, am I going to have guests and um, co-hosts and things like that. And my my answer to that is what could be more exciting than just listening to me talk, right? Why would I need anybody else? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I will have guests. Um, I typically like to do that sort of thing in person. I think in-person banter uh, I'm much better with. The problem is I don't really like to hang out with people. And the other problem is um, there's a pandemic occurring right now, and I don't really want people breathing their COVID all over me. So I don't have uh, plans to have in-person guests, at least until we have this virus uh, goes away or people are vaccinated or uh, whatever. So probably not until late 2021 would I have a physical guest with me. Now, could I do a Zoom type thing? I know I've seen podcasts where people sort of call in and they have their video link and everything. Now that is a possibility I might do. Um, so stay tuned for that. It won't be any time in the next couple of episodes, but that is something I'm looking into. Um, and we might talk to some other forensic pathologists, maybe some people who are in the fellowship or pathology residents, um, people who are working as uh, pathology assistants or autopsy technicians or random people, or I may just decide to just keep talking and then it's just me. So we'll see. 
Uh, secondly, uh, this is just a comment, not a question, a comment from me. Um, I had made um, a statement about this, I think, on my Instagram um, and my Twitter. But um, I had made a comment, I think it was in the last podcast, or it may have been in the one before. I don't know, it's been a thousand years, so I can't quite remember. But um, I had talked about how there is less hands-on experience in medical school now, and I sort of lament that. But it's always existed. It's existed in the last two or three decades, really. Um, and um, I had made kind of an offhand comment about medical students unable to recognize a kidney or something. And I was sort of being hyperbolic there. I don't really mean that medical students can't recognize obvious anatomic structures. Um, uh, what I was getting at is that there's so much more to learn now in medicine. Um, if you look at medicine, let's say 50 years ago or 75 years ago, we didn't really have to learn about the molecular basis of every single disease, the genetic basis of every single disease. Um, we didn't have thousands of medications and their interactions and their molecular basis that we had to learn about. And then now there's a whole um, aspect of the social aspects of medicine that we have to learn about. Um, I sort of dismissively used to call these hand-holding classes when I was in medical school because, you know, when you're a young medical student and you've studied and you just want to be a doctor, you just want to get out there and see patients or you want to you want to sew uh, surgical incisions and things like that. So I used to be kind of annoyed by them. But as we get further on in medicine, we see how important these these issues are, especially when you look at disparities in the way the healthcare is delivered in different communities to different um, groups of people. So the point is, is that medical students today have to spin dozens and dozens of plates all at once and try to keep them all spinning. And so sometimes things, um, they, they are, there's, there's not, um, time for everything and there's not really time for autopsies for medical students. And I think that people who, um, make up medical curriculums, uh, or is it curricula? Don't correct me. Um, or you can email me if you want. I don't care. Um, I just won't read it anyway. Um, it, you know, you can't, you have to think about, well, what's more likely for a person to, to need or to do and, and autopsy is just not real high on the list. Now, as a person who does autopsies every week, um, I think it's highly important because, uh, for every medical student, I mean, if I was in charge of a medical curriculum, I would make all medical students do forensics, um, or at least autopsy pathology, because I think that, there's a lot to be gained from seeing these things in person, from touching them, uh, from seeing the freshly dead is what I call them. Um, I think that even if you go into psychiatry and, and things where you're not going to physically touch the body, I just think that you can gain a lot from seeing the, the human body from the inside um, at least once or twice. And, um, you know, it just, it's not something that's happening right now a lot. And uh, you'd probably have to add an extra year of medical school. I know that as expensive as it is now, they're probably not wanting to add an extra year of medical school. So uh, enough of that diatribe. I know everyone's listening because there's a lot of people who want to know what it takes to become a forensic pathologist. And um, so this particular episode is going to focus on how to become a forensic pathologist slash medical examiner. And um, I'm not going to talk about why someone becomes that um, or why I became that, but it's more the how, the mechanics of how do you go from, you know, a high school student and go all the way through and become a medical examiner. Um, I'll, I'll get into the more philosophical reasons why someone would do that. In fact, I, I think that's going to be my last episode for season one later in 2020. Um, stay tuned for that. Um, you know, forensics is extremely popular among young people, especially in the last few decades. I think there's a lot more uh, popular culture attention paid to it. There's lots of um, television shows and books and things like that where forensic pathologists, medical examiners are the central character. And it is interesting. I think young people are inherently um, 
interested in death. Um, some people um, have an aversion to it. I think we all kind of have a curiosity about it. And um, it seems that, you know, I get so many questions every week. And it seems like um, a very popular um, among young women, um, not so much young men. I, I get some questions from young men about forensics, but it's probably eight, eight to two out of 10 young women. Um, and that's an interesting trend because in my own state, I think most of the uh, forensic pathologists are men. There, there might be one. I don't really know. I don't really um, interact with with the other pathologists in my state. As I said, I'm I'm in a I'm a uh, independent contractor, and I'm also a very antisocial hermit. So I don't really like to um, interact or talk to. Uh, quote unquote colleagues. I sort of like to do my own thing. But the point is, I would very much like to see um, more women going into the field, kind of balance out um, the uh, what used to be maybe a male heavy field. But there, there are, I mean, I went to the national meeting a couple of years ago, the National Association of Medical Examiners, and there are lots of um, female forensic pathologists. I know that there are uh, very prominent female forensic pathologists. Every, everyone knows about Dr. G, right? Um, she inspired an entire generation. I think that's why a lot of young people, um, young women thought about going into it. Um, she had a show, of course. Um, I think it was on, was it TLC, um, the Learning Channel? I'm not sure. You can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But she inspired a lot of people. Um, I met her at the national meeting. She is as nice in person as she seemed on that uh, show. She was um, uh, as intelligent. I mean, she's she's legit. She's th that same person that you see. That's not an act. And there are a number of um, Judy Melanick, of course. You guys probably have read Working Stiff and her some of her new fiction books that she's written with her husband, T.J. Mitchell. Um so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of female representation coming up now. So um, I just a little bit of an aside there, but I just wanted to to say that I'm glad to see that. Um, and um, but so why, you know, not really why did I go into it? But well, the interesting thing is, um, I didn't actually think about this in, at the, at a young age, and that's what strikes me now is I get a lot of people emailing me and messaging me. They're saying, I want to go into forensics. And they're like ninth graders. Or sometimes they're in college or they're 10th graders, but they're young people. I had absolutely uh, no idea. I mean, I didn't decide on forensics until much later. I was already a, a doctor when I decided. So that's an interesting trend that I'm seeing is that so many very young people are interested in it. Um, so this particular podcast will be um, geared toward very young people, but also people who are in college and are in medical school who might be thinking about it. And also for those people who are in none of those and maybe are thinking about a second career. Um, and by the way, this is not a career you can just pick up. You can't just go and become a forensic pathologist. It's actually pretty involved. Um, and I'm going to that's what we're going to get into first is the educational portion. But I've had a number of people who are in other careers who said, hey, I'm thinking about switching and going. Um, and so we'll talk about that as well. Um, I technically was a non-traditional student. Um, so, you know, it is possible. Don't don't worry. You don't have to go straight through college. And um, so at this point, by the way, I talked last time about advertisements. I did not put advertisements um, in on this one, because with it, like I said, I, I couldn't find a way to control what advertisements were going to be on there this time. So, um, until I'm able to do that, uh, to my liking, I'm going to do my own advertisements, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but, um, so I'm going to do a little Pavlovian thing. So you hear the bell, that's the bell, that's the advertisement bell. Um, so that's going to be a little break for ad. This is a going to be uh, an ad for my website, www.knifeafterdeath.com. Um, it's pretty simple. It's going to be the central hub for all of my stuff. 
You can get the podcast there. You can order books there. Um, I even have a thing for consults there. Um, but one of the things I'm doing is I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to have a weekly digest where you put in your email and I have your email. I mean, I don't personally, I'm not looking at it and I'm going to be emailing you randomly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create hopefully a weekly or some kind of frequency educational type thing. And then I will hit send. It might be about anything. It could be about gunshot wounds or it could be about uh, some kind of heart uh, anomaly or some interesting uh, anatomy finding. And then that'll go out to the mailing list to you guys. And um, then you'll, you know, you'll get that in your inbox and I hopefully won't bother you otherwise. But anytime I have something to announce, that's interesting. So, you know, like if there's a new podcast episode or if I have a new book coming out or something like that. So you can go to the website, knifeafterdeath.com, and then there's an area to sign up for the weekly digest. You just put in your um, your e email and your name, I think, and that's it. You don't do anything else. All right, that's the first ad, and I did the bell for the Pavlovian response. So now when you hear a bell, you'll instantly think of the, the website and you'll think of me. All right, so this whole thing about going into forensics is really broken into education and then there's the experience. People always want to know how they can get experience. And then there are intangibles, things that you can't teach, things that you can't acquire. You kind of have to have them in your soul. You have to, um, you know, they can't be taught. They, they can't really be gained. You just have to have them. We'll talk about that last, uh, but we'll talk about education first. So I think you have to ask yourself the question, do you want to be a forensic pathologist slash medical examiner? They're kind of the same thing. I'm not really going to tease out the difference with that right now. We can talk about that in another episode. Or do you just want to assist in autopsies? That's a completely different uh, realm. I mean, if you want to be an autopsy assistant or if you just want to be around dead bodies, that's that's a different issue. That's maybe a psychological issue for you. But um Th this podcast is specific to becoming a medical examiner, okay, which is what I am. Um, so, you know, you have to, I'm not going to be talking about if you want to just go learn how to do a dissection. That's completely different. This is, this is going and training completely to have, to become a medical examiner, forensic pathologist, where you'll be doing the autopsy, you'll be doing all the medical records, you'll be completing the report, you'll be going to court if it's a murder or if it's some kind of insurance case or something. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, you know, th the thing to note, I think, first of all, is that this is a special branch of medicine, okay? This is not a, um, uh, this is not like a trade school. Um, one time I had somebody email me and they, they kind of asked, Hey, um, you know, uh, can I just like go to, you know, like a two year school and become a forensic pathologist? Um, I was a little, I don't know, maybe I was a little insulted by that. Uh, but, but you know, the idea was, is that what they were getting at is, Oh, you just go chop up dead bodies. Um, clearly you don't need much more training than how to operate a chainsaw. Right. And, so um, I have to tell you, you have to become a doctor. You have to become a medical doctor to become a forensic pathologist. So I wanted to um, put that out there first because that is inescapable. There's no way you can become a forensic pathologist, a medical examiner without becoming a doctor first. So um, don't you know, don't click off on the podcast. Um, it's just, it's a fact of life. I didn't want to wait until the very end and then surprise you with that. Although we are probably almost 20 minutes in at this point, And I'm just now telling you that, but I think most people know that. Um, I just, I was surprised a little bit at how some people don't. And in fact, I've had actual medical doctors, actual colleagues, I guess you could call them colleagues in medicine, who didn't know that I was, you know, when I introduced myself and I say I'm a forensic pathologist, that they didn't realize I went to medical school just like they did. So that's pretty sad. So there's a lot of, there's a, there's a problem out there, I guess, um, 
with just getting that word out from an education perspective that yes, you have to be a doctor. Okay. So, um, and then, you know, this is of course, United States, uh, mostly who I'm talking to, but I have listeners worldwide. I'm sure worldwide, it's the same way. You have to have a medical degree to do that. I can't speak to every country, but I'm mainly talking about North America here, uh, that you have to go to medical school. So, um, I did want to address that up front. Um, the truth is, though, there are many paths that can lead to that destination of, of medical school, and there's no right way to do things. Um, there are probably some things to avoid. I, I wouldn't recommend, uh, you know, getting really bad grades and maybe failing out of school or something like that. Um, you know, I get questions from junior high students even this week. I got, I think, two questions from junior high students. They're like, what can I do to get on the right path to, you know, getting into becoming a medical examiner? And of course, I mean, that's really thinking ahead. Um, my my thing is just keep getting good grades. I don't, there's nothing you can really do as a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old. I mean, you just got to get good grades. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I was not the greatest uh, student in high school. I, I don't want to put that out there too much uh, because I don't want to tell people that they can go, um, you know, do poorly and then suddenly become a doctor because that's extremely difficult to do. Um, I I have an intuitive way about me, about the way that I do things where I can get I can get it. I can get the essential um, meaning of something without necessarily, um, you know, having gotten a, a wonderful grade on something. So in high school, um, had a couple of years there where I wasn't the most top notch human being on planet Earth. And um, it didn't end up hurting me that much because it didn't affect my ability to get into college. But I, I wouldn't recommend that to people. Um, you're you're going to hedge your bets the best way by just getting good grades. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but you definitely don't want to impede your ability to get into college. Um, so I think that's the first thing. So for young people, I don't think that when you're, you know, in junior high and high school, you need to really be thinking about medical examining because I mean, you're so far away from the process. What can you possibly do at that point? Um, I know I certainly wasn't thinking about it at that point. Um, so basically, you know, my experience was when I was in high school, um, you know, I, I wasn't, I was so far away from imagining medical school and much less being a medical examiner that I had, I would say a 0%. If someone had said, but do you think you'll be a medical examiner? I would say probably 0% chance. I mean, not even in the realm. In fact, we had a biology class in high school and, um, in that biology class, we had to dissect a rat. It was a big, fat, white rat. And I hated it. I hated the dissection of that rat. In fact, I remember it to this day. And we, they were in these big white buckets, like five gallon buckets. And then they were soaking in formaldehyde which is the chemical that we use even to uh, for surgical specimens when we're a pathologist and we, we need to fix those tissues. Um, it can be used in embalming fluid as well. And even at the autopsy table, when we remove organs and we dissect them, we put the remaining uh, pieces into formaldehyde. So as a pathologist, you're never away from formaldehyde. You're always going to be around it. Uh, but as a young person, I think I was a sophomore in high school, maybe I wanted nothing to do with that dissection. In fact, I pretty much wanted my lab partner to do it. I did not want to, uh, open the rat. I hated the smell of the formaldehyde. Um, I remember going to, um, was playing on some kind of sports team that spring that we were doing it. And it physically made me sick. Even after I would leave school, I still had that formaldehyde smell in my nose. And so I remember, you know, hours later I was like, man, I hate this. And so if you would have said, Hey, uh, 
you know, do you think you're going to go into something that involves dissection of anything? I would say absolutely not. And here I am years later and I'm now I'm dissecting human beings, if you can believe that. Human bodies anyway. And I've been around formaldehyde for well over 15 years, hopefully not to my detriment. Uh, but, you know, so you just, you can't possibly know. I mean, that's why in, you know, being in high school, don't worry if things don't seem to be clicking your way. Um, I would say try hard. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, you know, there's there's no... Um, there's no way to, to possibly know, um, how things are going to, are going to go. I mean, I, like I said, I, I didn't even want to do a rat and now I've done how many autopsies, like almost 2000, I think I, I, I don't have the exact number, but it's quite a bit. And yet not even one rat on, in my career, isn't that something? So, um, but, you know, it's very popular and it was even popular 20 years ago to think about medical examining. Um, I was at the end of, I think it was near the end of my first year of medical school. It could have even been the second year. I can't remember because we're almost two decades out. But we, as medical students, we had a meeting with the pre-med group at the university where, uh, and I was a uh, near Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, we were in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. That's where IU is. And they have a very big pre-med group there. So the pre-med group um, came for some kind of luncheon, I think. And the kids were there and they were um, inquiring with us, actual real live medical students, about uh, going to medical school, just asking questions and, you know, talking about careers and things like that. And um, I remember I had a small group with me, maybe six people. And I think that's how they broke it up. It's like each medical student had six or seven people that they talked to. Uh, and multiple of those people said that they wanted to become forensic pathologists, which blew my mind. Because at the time, even in medical school, I had no idea that I wanted to do forensics and even pathology. I mean, pathology was extremely interesting to me, but by no means did I think I wanted to be a pathologist or a forensic pathologist. And so to see these young people sort of eating their lunch and saying, oh, absolutely, I want to be a forensic pathologist, I had no answers to their questions. Um, but the interesting part about this is 20 years on, from that moment, uh, roughly 20 years, maybe 18, um, there are only 500 board-certified forensic pathologists in the United States of America, of which I have one. So if you take that group and you extrapolate it out across the pre-med group, across the entire country, and you assume that that was not anomalous, um, that, that, that the interest was kind of widespread, and based on what I'm seeing today, that the interest is also equally widespread. What happened? Why why aren't there more board certified forensic pathologists? Because I mean, 500 and in a population of what 330 million people, um, something is happening because there should be about 1,500. I think the National Association of Medical Examiners said that there should be about 1,500 to serve the needs of the country. Um, because again, not everyone that dies needs an autopsy, um, but anyone that dies, um, and if you listen to my last podcast, you know who needs an autopsy. And so if you didn't, there's your homework. Go back and listen to the last pod, uh, podcast. But uh, that's who needs an autopsy. And um, so you don't need like thousands and thousands of forensics. You only need enough to cover the autopsies that need to be done. So, So the point being is that there's a big gap in the motivation from young people who want to be forensic pathologists and then in those who actually go and become forensic pathologists. And then you've got people like me who, who was not motivated at all to become a forensic pathologist who ends up as a forensic pathologist. So that's, um, and I think based on my experience, just talking to some of my colleagues who went into it, most of them did not 
decide they are going to medical school to become a forensic pathologist. Most of them were going in for other reasons. They were going for surgery. They were going for um, all sorts of other reasons, and they decided along the way. You know, uh, as you move along through medical school, you kind of mentally rule out things. Like you have a rotation in a certain specialty, and you say, okay, now that I definitely don't like. I definitely do like this one, and I definitely don't like that one. And then, you know, after a couple of years, you've got it narrowed down to a few specialties. Uh, For me, um, you know, I had it narrowed down to a couple of specialties. Um, I was, I had not ruled out surgery, and I had not ruled out emergency medicine. And um, by virtue of not having a pathology rotation, I had not ruled out pathology, but that was simply because medical school did not require that as a clinical rotation. Um, Most people are uh, surprised to find out that I interviewed uh, in my residency to become an emergency physician. And in fact, interviewed at multiple places and had good conversations with program directors uh, who, you know, basically guaranteed me spots in their program. So, Um, I could be an emergency physician right now. Um, And then what happened was, um, and I am digressing a little bit from the topic, but I'm showing my point is to show you that you never know what's going to happen. I'm doing ER medicine. I do a pathology rotation. And then I find out during that rotation that everything clicks for me um, completely, um, 100% fall in love with it, decide to become a pathologist drop all of my ER applications, switch over to pathology. Everything happened in in a period of about six weeks. And then um, I'll get more into how I got into forensics in just a bit. But um, I I think what I wanted to address is is the gap between why people say they want to go into forensics and then don't end up there. Otherwise, why would we only have 500 people who are qualified to do it. I also want to note that although 500 people are qualified, there are a number of people who are um, doing forensics but not necessarily board certified. So they are pathologists who are helping out in forensic offices. um, And I can't quote the numbers, but you can do forensic autopsies, so to speak, I guess, in forensic offices, um, but not necessarily cases that are going to go to court. So cases that come to forensic offices that are natural deaths and accidents and things like that that aren't going to go to court can be handled by a pathologist that's not board certified. So, I mean, I'm just putting a ballpark figure. I would say that there are a total of a thousand people probably doing forensic autopsies out there, Um, but only 500 qualified to do things like murders and things like child deaths and things like um, insurance or malpractice related deaths. Those are the board certified forensics. Okay, so why the gap? That's really what what I'm getting at. Why the gap? Well, I think maybe it has something to do with the fact that it takes 13 years after high school to get there. Okay, 13 years. Now take a deep breath. I know that's a lot of time, 13 years. Um, It's four years of a college degree, four years of medical school, get an MD or a DO, four years of residency training in pathology, and then one year of fellowship in forensic pathology. Now, important to note that this is an estimate because college, of course, can be done in three years. Um, Residency can be done in three years doing something called like anatomic path only, not doing clinical path. Some forensic pathology, pathology fellowships can be two years. But no matter how you split it up, you're looking at 12 to 13 years after high school. And um, I think some people hear that number and it's a little bit oppressive. Um, I'm not sure that it should be. Um, I just think that some people want to get started in life. You know, they turn uh, 18 and everybody wants to get out and make money and get a job. But, you know... You have to have a little bit of a drive in life and realize that not everything is instantaneous and it takes a huge amount of commitment to learn all the medicine that you need to learn to become a medical examiner or a doctor. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but 
I think that some of that is that that long road that it takes to get there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, 12 to 13 years. And at that point, even at that point, you're considered a beginner forensic pathologist. I mean, you're still going to need a mentor at that point to teach you the ins and outs of the difficult cases. I mean, I guess I'm in my what sixth year uh, doing forensics and I still have cases that can drive me mad from a, a difficulty perspective. So, you know, you still have to lean on people who, uh, who know more than you, um, and ask them questions. So even getting out after 13 years, you, you need a lot of help, but, uh, you know, so, but let's just say that you're still not deterred at this point. What people now, let's say you get to the college part. I get a lot of people in college saying, what should I major in? What should I major in? What's the perfect major? Should I major in forensics? Well, I mean, if you're interested in forensics, that's great. Major in forensics if you want. Um, a lot of colleges don't have a forensics major. Some of them do. Some of them don't. Um, I'm not real big on college major. I don't really care. Um, I think a science makes a lot of sense because medical school is is a lot of science. Um, I personally got a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology. I think microbiology is a really good field to 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 prepare for medical school because of all the infectious disease and things like that. But I mean, frankly, biology, chemistry, um, there were people in my class, medical school class that did mathematics. There were people that had physics. But the fact is, there were people that also majored in literature, religion, art. I mean, frankly, you know, it, it doesn't matter all that much. Um, I, again, I, I am a big fan of majoring in science before medical school because I think it prepares you very well for your MCAT, your medical college admission test. Um, I think it makes the first year of medical school probably a little bit easier you, I don't think you're starting as far behind because you've had so many credits in college, um, you know, compared to other people who like, I mean, let's just say you're an art major, um, which I would have loved to have done by the way, but let's say you're an art major and half your credits are in art, um, you know, and then only half your credits are in science. Maybe you're not going to have as much science experience. However, at the end of the day, what matters is, uh, you apply with a pretty good MCAT score and a and a good GPA. So it's all about how comfortable you feel as a person. If you feel comfortable with just doing the prerequisites with a major, let's say in literature, and then you do your prerequisites, you take your organic chemistry and you take your physics, but you've got a good GPA and you've got a good MCAT score, knock yourself out. I think it's great. Um, the positive of a non-science major, or let's say a double major, if you were to do a science and a non-science, is that it makes you look um, well-rounded. I think medical school admission committees uh, probably like people uh, who have a science and then something completely unrelated. I think that makes you um, look uh, studious. It makes you uh, someone who might be able to be relatable to patients. Um you know, I think that I personally, if I was on an admissions committee, I would find that very interesting and very intriguing. Um, but it comes down to there is no perfect major. You just got to do what is going to be best for your application. Now, I want to take a second here and it's ad time. It's ad time. And this time I'm going to do an ad. Now, this is not for me. I'm not plugging myself this time, if you can believe that. This is a book. This is a book called Compendium Pandemica, A Guide to Horrible Infectious Diseases by the author A.D. Gray. This available at Amazon.com. I think it's also available at BarnesandNobles.com. A.D. Gray, you may know her uh, from Instagram. Autopsy.pathology is the page. She is a writer, but she's also a PA, a pathology assistant. Very nice woman, very talented, has an excellent uh, page on Instagram, and like me, very interested in writing and very interested in pathology. She's written a book on infectious disease, and um, I suggest you check it out. You can go to 
um, Amazon, and you can check that book out and buy it. Buy it and learn about infectious diseases, because as you know, we are in the time of infectious disease right now with this um, pandemic. And um, these are the kind of books that I really liked in college, like uh, college and medical school. When I would go to the bookstore, I would always look for these these infectious disease type books. So check it out. I think she just released it a month a month ago or so. And um, so she's a friend of mine and a very talented and intelligent person. So check it out. I'm going to say it again. Compendium Pandemica, a guide to horrible infectious diseases. All right, back to the show. So what about, uh, now we're talking about medical school. Let's, I'm not going to do the whole thing about interviewing for medical school, flying across the country and interview tactics and all that stuff. Um, you know, I could talk about that all day, all night. I don't want to do a podcast on that. Um, I could give you advice, but I don't have infinite time, unfortunately. Um, you know, it would, it would be, it would be beyond the point of this podcast. So I will talk a little bit about medical school because a lot of people want to know what that's all about. So, so what is it about? Um, I mean, you know, you've seen, you see it a lot on TV. You can read about it, watch YouTube videos and all that stuff, but, but what's it really like? How hard is it? So what I tell people is medical school is like, take your hardest college semester and then maybe make it a little bit harder and then put it on repeat um, until you're done. Uh, certainly the first two years, because the first two years um, is all book learning. I, I shouldn't say all because you do have some clinical responsibilities. And, and again, I can't speak for every medical school and you have to consider I've been out for quite a while now, but um, it used to be structured where it would be two years of kind of like book learning where you take things like gross anatomy, um, which I mean, technically isn't really book learning because you have a cadaver, but physiology, histology, um, gross anatomy, microbiology, pathology, things like that, where you're mostly learning from textbooks and taking tests you know, pharmacology, biochemistry, genetics, things like that. So like your hardest college classes on steroids for two straight years and studying mm, pretty much all your free time. So it's a real haul, um, but it is a little bit like being in college. I mean, it's still fun. You still get breaks, and um, I still had plenty of time to work out and, you know, play basketball and take trips and things like that. I mean, it's it's not that insane. Um, there are big, important board exams. Uh, there's a big board exam at the end of the second year, um, which can have big impact on your future in terms of, you know, your residency of choice and things like that. Um, so that's the first two years of medical school, kind of like in a nutshell. The last two years of medical school is kind of like clinical wards, um, clinics, where you actually do rotations through the specialties. You're really with real um, doctors and, and residents, fellows, in specialties like, you know, neurology, surgery, OBGYN, family medicine, uh, you name it, there's a clerkship for it, including pathology. Some of them are required. Some of them are um, electives like forensic pathology or pathology itself probably are electives at most schools. Um, and certainly they were electives at my school. And that's why most people don't get exposure to it until it's too late and they've already chosen a residency program. So um, that's why I think you don't see more people going into it, frankly. Um, so, you know, you have to consider that. Um, but, you know, the, the rotations are about a, a month long to sometimes six weeks to sometimes two months. Um, again, I'm being general. Every medical school has their different take on it. And these, you are functioning kind of like an assistant to the doctor, an assistant to the resident, and you are doing clinical medicine. I mean, you are examining patients, you're talking to patients. In some cases, you are doing procedures, um, but you're on a very short leash. Um, it's fun, but it's a lot of hard work, and you're still doing book learning. You're still taking tests. So altogether, medical school is pretty difficult. But um, I found it to be very fun. I mean, 
you have to want to learn. And I was, I mean, that's what I wanted to do. I was super excited once I got in, um, you know, it was exhausting, but it was also exactly what I wanted. I had craved for so long to learn this information about medicine and about the human body, um, and about disease. It was everything that I personally wanted. Um, so you'll know in your heart that that's what you want. And if that's not what you want, then certainly, um, don't go into it because it's kind of expensive too. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the financial aspect because it's very different now than it was when I went through. Um, and I think there are different ways to, you know, get financial assistance. And sometimes it's more expensive if you go in state school versus out of state. That's something you, that's just, you know, you're going to have to make that decision on your own. And it's again, beyond the, the realm of this particular podcast. Now, how many people go into pathology and how many people go into forensics out of medical school? Now, in my class, there were about 280 people. I had a very large medical school class. They're generally not that big. Um, and uh, there were seven people in my class that went into pathology, which at the time was considered an astronomical percentage of people. That came out to about 2.5%. Uh, normally, it's 1% or less of graduates go into pathology. And among that pool of 1%, um, even less go into forensics because usually they get into residency and, you know, then they, once you're in residency, most people just do surgical path or cytopath um, working in a hospital, which is also very fun, by the way. Um, and then they don't make it to forensics. Um, um, I think why do most why do a lot of people not go into forensics? I think there's a lot of anti anti uh, pathology and anti-forensics bias in medical school. I mean, when I was in medical specialties in the ICU and doing, you know, internal medicine, when I hinted that I might go into pathology, um, there was a lot of pushback from that. Um, people would say, you know, like my resident would say, well, you're very good with patients. Why would you be going into uh, pathology? That's ridiculous. And and I would think, well, that's kind of rude because I've kind of already made the decision. And, uh, and, and also I don't think, you know, I, I think you have to go into what you're best with and I'm best with people who aren't talking to me. And if I can not talk to other people, so therefore pathology was particularly with forensics is, is better for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty good with patients. I can actually have a personality, believe it or not. Um, but it's a strain for me. Anyway, um, so there was a lot of anti-pathology bias, uh, not so much from my classmates. I mean, there was a little bit. I'll tell a story about that uh, toward the end of this podcast run in season one. There were a couple of incidents with some of my classmates, none of the ones I actually like, but um, but there were a couple of incidents that was that was kind of hurtful. Um, well, what it didn't really hurt me, but it was sort of funny. And I think that people just, they, they don't like that. They, they, they feel ashamed that they're going into a field that doesn't, um, that isn't patient facing. And so then they, they, they say, well, that's it. I'm not, I like pathology, but I just can't go into it. I'm going to have to go into something that's acceptable to my parents or to my friends or whoever. Um, so, you know, you just have to go into what you like. And, uh, for, for me, pathology was definitely the way to go. Um, Let's see here. And, you know, for me, of course, I mean, just psychologically, I like to know the answer. Um, and pathology is great because you're always going to have, almost always going to have an answer when you take a biopsy or when you have something that you're looking at with an autopsy. You almost always end with the answer. And uh, that's very gratifying for me. Um, and then now, you know, I mean, we've talked about medical school briefly, obviously, and then finally we go to residency. So what is residency? Um, I'll explain it like I do in court. Residency training is, is the specialty that makes you a pathologist. So you finish medical school and you're a doctor, but you're sort of unformed. You're just a generic doctor. You're not anything yet. And then residency is what makes you a internal medicine or makes you a, um, you know, a general surgeon or makes you a pathologist. And so for pathology, most people do what's called an APCP residency, which is anatomic pathology, clinical pathology. 
anatomical pathology stands uh, or refers to anything where you take tissue out of the body and then you make a diagnosis off of it. So that would be like a biopsy, like a breast biopsy, a colon biopsy, take an appendix out, take a lung or a pancreas out. The pathologist processes that, makes the diagnosis with various tests, molecular tests, looking under the microscope, that sort of thing. Clinical pathology is um, what you think of when you hear the word lab test. So any kind of uh, lab testing you can do with microbiology, blood testing, looking at the microscope for hematology, blood cells, um, clinical chemistry. I mean, I can go on and on. Blood banking. It's a huge field. Both are huge fields. Uh, forensic pathology is a branch of anatomical pathology. And then, um, so it's a four-year thing usually. And at the end of the four years, you end up having to fly to Tampa, Florida and taking a two-year test. A two-year, I'm sorry. It feels like two-year. It's a two-day test. Um, two full days sitting at a computer and also looking into a microscope. And it's like seven or 800 questions. And then that's called your board exam. And then if you pass it, you become board certified in forensics um, in, you know, um, I guess, uh, anatomical, um, sorry, not forensics, anatomical and uh, clinical. And uh, that's, that's how you become a pathologist. So now at that point, you are a pathologist. You're not a forensic pathologist, you're a pathologist. And you can go get a job or you can go do a fellowship. These days, most people are doing fellowships and there are fellowships in everything. I mean, there are fellowships in like genetics, there are fellowships in microbiology, there are fellowships in cytopathology, there are fellowships in, let's just say, genitourinary pathology, there are fellowships in liver pathology, and then of course, forensics. So, you know, obviously there, it's just, you just keep going and going and going. Some people end up doing like three fellowships. I personally got out and I did what was called a junior fellowship at um, my institution, which was kind of a hybrid between actually getting a job and working on my own and then a kind of a fellowship training program where they train you to be a surgical pathologist. So I was like a hospital type pathologist where um, uh, what you call surgical pathologist, where the, the tissue was taken out of the body and then I make the diagnosis and I was working a lot, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, just looking in the microscope. And uh, the truth is I actually did surgical pathology for like um, about six years before I decided on forensics and then a uh, hospital situation is, you know, um, so I, some people like working in hospitals. I actually really do like the hospital and I do like surgical path, but I always kind of felt like I would enjoy forensics. And uh, there was a fellowship position that opened nearby at the place nearby where I worked. And lo and behold, I was able to get that fellowship position. So, um, I did the fellowship in forensics and, um, that is, of course, you could probably do two or three podcast episodes on just the fellowship in forensics. In fact, people have asked me to write a book on just my fellowship in forensics. But like I said, Judy Melanick wrote a book on her fellowship in forensics. So what can I really add to the, you know, to the the literature the literary uh, elements of a forensic fellowship she already wrote a really good book on it so i doubt i'll write a book on forensic fellowship but i'll i definitely will write a book on forensics in general um the fellowship i think hers was 2 years mine was 1 year you do autopsies i was in a major you know metropolitan center where all of the uh, city of a million people um where all of the bodies that uh, deserve autopsy. A lot of homicides come. And then of course the fellow, there was only one fellow that was me. And then the fellow gets all the cases that are really not such great cases. Um, so really hard cases, you know, all the stabbings and all the gunshot wounds and people, um, who die via some of these, you know, gunshot wounds. Now keep in mind, somebody dies of a gunshot wound, um, in the inner city, it seemed like there was never just one gunshot wound. There was always like 25 gunshot wounds. And so, of course, I have these autopsies where I have to map out every single pathway of 
maybe 20 gunshot wounds and there's like three victims. So these autopsies would take, you know, all day. Sometimes they would take two days. You'd have to put them back in the cooler, get them back out, work on them for two days. And that's what my fellowship was like. So yeah, um, fellowship was pretty difficult. I had a really hard year. Um, it's really exhausting. Um, had some health problems that year. Um, probably I'll, I'll do a podcast kind of detailing, uh, what happened during the fellowship. Um, but you know, it was a good experience. I think it made me into a pretty good forensic pathologist. Uh, but even once you finish, then you go back to Tampa, Florida and you, and you take your test and in your room, your one room, same room you take your boards in for your anatomic and clinical. And it's just a one day test. It's not two days again. And if you pass it, you become board certified in forensics. And then once again, you're a beginner. So that's the story of how you become a forensic pathologist, the educational story. And uh, now we're going to talk about really quickly, we're going to talk about how to get experience. We're going to talk about some of the intangibles. But before we do, that's right, it's ad time, um, free ads. Uh, promoting mainly myself and my friends. Okay, so this one is, some of you know that I wrote a book last year. I released it, uh, I believe, uh, late October, and it's still for sale. So you can go to Amazon.com and buy it. It's called The Handbook of Zombie Forensics and Medicine. And you'll know it when you see it because it's got a green cover, and it's green and black. And basically what it is, is I wrote a book, um, where you can learn about forensics, and that book is um, based on if there was a zombie apocalypse, and how would we handle it from a forensic perspective. That's the best way that I can summarize it shortly. Um, it's done pretty well. People seem to really like it, and it's a really good way to learn about forensics at the same time reading it in a kind of an entertaining um, vehicle, which is the zombie apocalypse. I also talk a lot about pandemics throughout that book, which is kind of eerie and also disturbing because I, it released about a month before the pandemic, um, uh, you know, occurred in China. Uh, when we first heard about the, the pandemic, um, in December, I, I think it released in physical form, the book released in physical form in November. And then in, we heard in December about the COVID-19 uh, the new uh, coronavirus. So um, no, I was not involved in the planning of that pandemic. I was not uh, uh, preparing to uh, microchip a vaccine or anything like that. So if you're interested in that book, you can buy the print copy or you can buy the e-copy. And also, um, you know, you can see if you like that sort of thing. And if you do, um, I may have a new book uh, coming out Somewhat related to that, I also, people have been asking about a second edition for that book where I put in the legal aspects um, related to killing of zombies, whether or not they're type 1 or type 2 zombies. And then you say, well, Dr. Wolf, what do you mean by type 1 or type 2 zombies? Ah, well, then you have to buy the book to find out. All right, back to the final parts of the podcast, and then we'll finish up here just over an hour. So one of the big questions I get is experience. How do I get experience, Dr. Wolf? I want to know how to get experience on dead bodies, so to speak. And um, I think people are very fascinated about just, you know, I want to get in and I want to be around dead bodies. I um, think that's a little creepy, but, you know, I know people ask this question every week. Um, I'll tell you my personal uh, policy is I don't let anybody in under 18, and I get kids asking me, 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, please, can I come watch an autopsy? No, I can't. You're not an adult. Um, you got to be 18. And generally, you can't just be curious. Oh, I just want to come and see what a dead body looks like. Nope, that's not a good enough reason. You need to be going into nursing. You're going into mortuary school. You're going to be a deputy coroner. You want to be a medical student. You're going to go to college. You want to be um, even a lawyer, somebody who wants to go be a prosecutor, a district attorney, something like that. Um, I will allow them to come and see um, also an EMT or someone like that. Anybody involved in medicine, law, um, or something involving the mortuary business, I will say, please, yes, you can come in. I have actually banned all visitors since the start of the pandemic because having an extra person in the morgue exposes them and I do not want them to get sick, nor do I want somebody to come in and get us sick. So 
Um, right now, I'm not personally taking any visitors. Um, I do like having visitors because I like to teach, believe it or not. Um, people seem to respond to my um, methods of teaching. Um, but my personal thing is I don't have anybody under 18, and I think most places don't because it's a liability issue. Um, there are privacy issues. Obviously, you don't want somebody going and and leaving and then posting on social media, hey, guess what? Dr. Wolf showed me a dead body, and it was a 22-year-old male, and his name was so-and-so, and he had this tattoo, and so-and-so. And then all of a sudden, I'm sued. So, uh, And I don't think any other pathologist wants that as well. Secondly, what if you bring in a young person and they faint and hit their head on the floor and then they have a subdural hemorrhage and then the entire county gets sued for $70 million? So we we don't bring in young people under 18. Um, probably you have to have them sign a release as well. And that's why um, having visitors and when people ask me about experience, it depends on what state you're in. Um, I get questions a lot from all around the country, where, how can I get in to see an autopsy? My first question is, what state are you in? And they say, well, why, you know, uh, I'm in Missouri or I'm in Florida. Well, the reason why it matters is because if you are in a medical examiner system, I have found that it is actually a little more difficult to get in to see a case because a medical examiner system um, versus a coroner system seems to be a little more difficult because it is regulated by the state. Um, you know, from head to toe, from top to bottom, it is a state government entity. Not that the coroner system isn't, but the ability to become a deputy coroner in a coroner system um, is, I think it's a little less stringent. And so as a result, it's easier to, um, you know, to come into a facility. And um, I've certainly had that experience. So I guess what I would say to listeners is find out if you are in a medical examiner state or a coroner state. Then if you want experience, if you want to be able to see a case, then call your local office. Do you have a medical examiner's office or do you have a coroner's office? Call them um, or email them, I guess, and then explain why. Are you a medical student? Are you a uh, wanting to be a district attorney? Are you wanting to be an EMT? Would this help? Why would this help? Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a really good answer for those who want experience. I personally did not see my first autopsy until I got in the field. I mean, I, I went over this in the podcast, you know, my first autopsy occurred when I was a pathology resident. And so my experience even though I tried to get it before medical school, it didn't happen. And so uh, sometimes you just have to persevere and wait. Um, and then maybe you'll get lucky. Or some people go to mortuary school and they become mortician, they become educated in that, and then they get experience with dead bodies. Now, I personally don't know anybody that's done mortuary school, then went to medical school. But, I mean, that is one way to to get experience in the field or certainly would be uh, a good way to break the ice if you're going to become uh, some kind of death investigator or deputy coroner. Um, I think in medical examiner states, they call them medical legal death investigators, and in coroner states, they'll call them deputy coroners. They're kind of interchangeable uh, terms. Um, and I think that's really all I can say about experience. I mean, sometimes experience, you just have to um, wait for the educational portion to allow you to get in, but you know, just give people a call and email, see what you can, what you can get, and maybe it'll work out. Now, finally, what about intangibles? So, can you know, can anyone become a forensic pathologist? No, I don't think so. Um, if if anyone could do it, I doubt there would be five hundred in the country, right? Um, and I'm not trying to seem like, oh, look how elite we are. Um, I've had many people tell me I really couldn't do what you do. And I don't blame them because it's really not, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot to it physically and emotionally. Uh, so, you know, I mean, let's, let's go over physically what, what do you need to be a forensic pathologist? Well, number one, I mean, I think you need a strong stomach. Okay. Uh, you can't be, uh, vomiting every time you you see something gross, and because 
that would be every day, every day at work. Um, you know, you're going to see something pretty disgusting because you have to, to open up a human body and take everything out. And that includes the contents of the, the stomach and the intestines and everything else that could be in there. So strong stomach, you got to have that. And you can become desensitized. People ask me, well, can you get used to it? And I say, yes, yes, you can, because I can remember being um, kind of turned off by the smell and the consistency of stomach contents. And, you know, years later, I feel a little bit better about it. It's still pretty sickening, but uh, I feel better about it. All right, next is a, I think, a sense of smell that's not so acute. That's that it's just uh, like a super sensory sense of smell. My sense of smell is it's not that great. Um, I mean, it's not com- complete anosmia, which means which that's the medical term for you can't smell at all. Um, but it's not so acute that um, I can pick up the s- slightest scent of decomposition uh, because the the scent of decomposition is is uh, it's pretty acrid smell. And then, of course, once you open the body, um, even the freshly dead, it's a pretty strong smell because of the contents of the intestines. And then also, if somebody has taken in uh, particularly alcohol, um, alcohol or sometimes food that has a particular odor to it, um, once it mixes with the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, it can produce a really, really strong odor. So, um, the smells, sometimes I see people run out of the room, not, not anybody like police or assistants, but when we have people visit, um, sometimes people just can't handle it. Like as soon as I open the abdomen, people will run out. So, um, you have to think about your sense of smell. Now there are ways around that. Sometimes people will put on like a Vicks, you know, Vicks vapor rub. They'll put that over the top of their lip or sometimes people will light, you know, incense, um, I, I'm not a big fan of that. I've never done the incense thing because, uh, I just feel like using these other, um, you know, like aromas. I feel like if you're making something smell like pine, you're just making it like death flavored pine. I don't feel like it ever really covers it up. Um, next would be steady hands. You know, there's a misconception that we, quote, chop up dead bodies, okay? I don't use an axe. I don't use a chainsaw. I don't use a hatchet. It is a surgical procedure, and it is a very precise procedure at times. And number two, many of these bodies contain um, infectious diseases, horrible infectious diseases. If I quote the A.D. Gray book title, um, Many people have hepatitis C, HIV, tuberculosis, some have COVID-19, and the last thing you want to do is slip and cut yourself. So you need good steady hands and good surgical technique that'll make for a nice neat dissection and in which you do not cut yourself. So good surgical skills, and also you have to consider that a lot of these bodies um, are going to go to a funeral home, mortuary service afterward, and you don't want to hack up the body and make it difficult for the mortician afterwards. You want to make it to where their job is easy as well. And the best way to do that is to not hack through all the blood vessels because they use those blood vessels to put embalming fluid in. So good surgical techniques with steady hands. And then endurance. Yes, endurance. Um, I have had days multiple times where I have done eight autopsies in a day. Yes, it's true. Um, Those days are horrible, but I have had it done before a, a few times um, I have since um, cut my uh, hours, cut my work so that I don't have to do that anymore. But, um, you know, sometimes you'll have five, six, seven, eight autopsies in a day and you have to stand there and it's like a surgeon, a neurosurgeon who, you know, has to stand 10, 12 hours for a surgery. Well, occasionally for forensics, you have days like that and you have somebody, um, one time I had a case with a hundred gunshot wounds. Um, that's a case, that's a, a 12 hour a day two day autopsy. So almost 24 hours of just standing there. Um, so yeah, endurance is a good thing. I think those are the main physical attributes there. Um, now emotional attributes. Um, I think these are important as well, uh, because you can't pick and choose your cases. Um, you know, when you are the doctor on for, for on call or on service, 
You can't say, well, I don't like to do kid cases. It makes me upset. Well, sorry, if you're on call and a child case comes in, that's your case. So you have to be able to disconnect emotionally from the case and be the investigator. Um, You know, the visuals can be really, really bad for these cases, whether they're traumatic people that are torn apart, blown up, you know, shredded, destroyed, burned, um, abused, um, you know, severely beaten. Um, You know, we see murders and sometimes they are innocent, very innocent people. Sometimes they're little, uh, little children and older people. And you have to realize, yes, they are humans, but you're going to be the doctor. You're going to treat this, um, as the investigator, you're the anatomical, uh, person who's going to do the anatomical, anatomical exam in order to achieve justice. I guess that's how I look at it. I'm able to disconnect because I look at my role as the seeker of justice, okay? So if I don't do my role properly, then justice will not be served. I will, if I break down emotionally and I can't do the case, then I will compromise the ability for justice to be served. So um, that's the way that I look at it. So if you can't disconnect emotionally from the case, um, then forensics would not be for you. So, uh, and then academically, so that's the emotional aspect. Academically, of course, uh, the academic aspect is a strong scientific background. Um, You also have to have a logical approach. I mean, these cases have um, multiple variables, right? Because you have the investigative information from the police. You have the medical information from the medical records. Sometimes you'll get thousands of pages of medical records, And then you have the information that you get from the autopsy itself, which is another section of medical information or or medical record that you get. And then you have to put all of it together, synthesize it, use your logic, and then come up with the final diagnosis. So it's a huge amount of synthesis. Um, So, you know, that is the academic portion. And then finally, communication ability, because there's a there's a part here that I haven't even talked about, and that is forensic pathologists and medical examiners. We talk to families. Uh, When families don't understand, sometimes we, we have to talk to them about the results uh, and we have to communicate those results. And if you cannot communicate effectively, family will not understand. Um, We have to talk to police. We have to talk to prosecutors, lawyers, uh, defense attorneys, death investigators, We're also teachers of medicine. Pathologists, I think, uh, are some of the the great teachers of medicine. Uh, But the biggest one of all is that we are in court. Pathologists are in court. And we, therefore, have to be able to sit on the stand and defend our our findings. And so that's our findings at autopsy and our conclusions. So you have to have a certain confidence and you have to have a certain communication ability And not just communication with lawyers and doctors, but you have to understand that it is not uh, the lawyers you have to convince. It's a jury you have to convince. A jury consisting of, you know, multiple people, let's say 12 people, um, who may uh, only have a rudimentary education. So you have to be able to take complex topics and break them down into very easy to understand topics. So the job of a forensic pathologist medical examiner is a a very huge uh, undertaking, not only um, physically and not only academically, but also in the realm of communication and logical synthesis and things like that. Because we have, uh, as much as as people say, um, I want to be a forensic pathologist because I hate talking to people, the, the, the truth is you actually end up talking to a lot of people. You just don't talk to your patient. That's, that's the thing. Um, and maybe I should have put that first so that people could click this uh, podcast off if they don't want to listen anymore. But um, yeah, this is the only field where you don't talk to your patient because even patho- regular pathologists talk to their patients sometimes. Back when I was a hospital pathologist, I did occasionally have to call patients or talk to patients on the floor. Uh, Forensics do not talk to their patients, but they do talk to everyone else. And you have to have good communication skills. 
So, um, and if you don't, I think that everything suffers. So with that being said, I think um, this covers the basics of it. It's a difficult uh, thing to summarize in just one podcast. It probably could have been two or three episodes, but um, I know that we're going to have to start talking about actual forensics and and how to diagnose certain cases soon. Um, this is kind of an introductory series uh, that I wanted to get down at this point. And, uh, you know, I think we're getting there. So if you have any questions, uh, as always, you can reach out to me. But I think that this particular um, episode has hopefully answered most of the questions that you have. And if not, you can uh, leave me a comment. Hopefully this one's going to go up on YouTube. And I know that I'll probably get a lot of uh, comments on YouTube. It seems like most people like to comment there. Uh, But otherwise, I will be back with episode seven. Uh, soon enough and thank you once again for listening.